All right. Welcome to the May 13th, 2024 in Oncrites Working Group meeting. I'm going to take a look at the uh, revocation specification that Mike Lauder's been working on. And I've been going through um, what's happening in the W3C VCDI uh, BBS working group and discussions about possible next steps. Uh, getting support, just wanted to check in on status on getting support in the new and on creds B2 for BBS and reminder of a new meeting time. And hopefully we can talk through that as well. I, I see uh, Richard, you're here. Good to have you here and um, maybe talk through the doc and on creds two stuff. All right, um, we are recording. Hopefully that is good with everyone. Um, the uh, This is a Linux Foundation meeting, so the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect. And this is a Hyperledger meeting, so the code of conduct is in effect. Um, I have um, posted in the chat the um, uh, uh, link to the agenda page if anyone wants to go in and um, track updates and so on, please do so. All the links are, uh, for this will be posted here. As will the recording. Yeah. Um, anyone new that wants to introduce themselves and talk about why they're here uh, or wants to make any announcements or wants to make any updates to the agenda, please do so now. Grab the mic. Uh, I probably count as new. I haven't been in this meeting in probably four years, <laughs> three years, but the, uh, feels like I'm, uh, you know, back in old times, hanging out with this crew. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Richard Esplin. I worked with Mike and Sean at Evernim and, uh, collaborate with, with Steven on Sovereign and Indy, uh, with the BC Gov team. And I have moved to be head of product at Doc Labs, uh, last, uh, last fall. And uh, in Doc Labs, we have a privacy preserving credential format that is BBS plus. Well, it's going to be BBS 2023. We're making that switch. And it uh, uh, provides all the things that Anon Creds used to provide with the BBS format. And uh, joining or on this call as well as Lavesh. Uh, Lavesh is uh, also former Evernim. Uh, he was one of the original architects writing Anon Creds uh, version one. And so it was really neat when I joined Doc Labs and found out that Levesh had already built all the stuff I wanted to I wanted to build when we were talking about Anon Creds V2 in 2019. Uh, I do realize there's some overlap with some of the work that Mike's been doing over the past year or so. Uh, so, or two years, I should say, Mike. Uh, so we, sh we should talk about what that means. But yeah, uh, Anon Creds is a, uh, or Doc's anonymous credential format. Uh, we, are using it in production today. Uh, we have customers who who have uh, see it as differentiative and, and therefore they like us, but they also want to know uh, how interoperable we can be, who else is interested in things like that. So that's what's driving us to talk with this group and see if if there is enough commonality that we can show that interoperability together. So I look forward to that part of the conversation today. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Richard. And great to have you here, Lavash. I don't know that we've ever been on a call before, but your name's legendary in the community and, and good to be on a call with you. Hi, Stephen. No, I, I don't think we have a talk, but thanks uh, for having me in the call. Lavash is like my counterpart. Yep. Excellent. Hi, Long time no see. <laughs> well, I still can't see you, but I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, good to hear you. Awesome. All right. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? All right. Um, Mike, do you want to take the uh, screen and share anything, or how do you want to go about this part? That would be fine. Let me find uh, the right thing. Uh, okay, there it is. Okay. Um, so for those of you that don't know, I work at uh, Lit Protocol. We are a decentralized key management service. So everything we do is MPC based, including BBS plus signing, punchable sanders, some of that stuff. We mostly just key management. We don't necessarily deal with credentials. So a lot of this work has 
been uh, research as I was finishing my PhD and wanting to get some additional uh, features that I thought were lacking in a non-creds one and uh, also speed things up from a revocation perspective. So this proposal uh, addresses, I would say, probably 90% of those. Um, and I'd like to help standardize this uh, revocation system. Uh, I did not include all the MPC stuff in here, but everything you see in here can be done in a very easy MPC way with almost no interactions between the nodes themselves because it's similar to a BBS plus or a BLS signature based. But anyway, uh, this proposal talks about, you know, I'd start by comparing all the other uh, revocation systems out there. So I'm kind of just going to skip over that part. You're welcome to go read it in your own time. Um, but the main thing I wanted to talk about here was what data you put in the revocation scheme itself. Like what does the data object look like and what is needed for that? So as a brief background, this revocation is based on an accumulator, but the updates uh, do not require, um, like if you're doing ads, the accumulator does not need to change at all, only on when you actually remove values from the accumulator do you have to actually publish updates. Otherwise, it can just sit there for as long as it, it takes between uh, various things. So... Uh, the main purpose I have here is just to show you kind of what the, at a minimum, what the revocation registry should contain. I put an identifier in there, um, which is just some random string. And then I have what I call the signature verification key, because assuming you're going to put this somewhere like a public message board, whether that's a blockchain or somewhere else, you should authenticate that this accumulator is actually legitimate. And then the accumulator requires a verification key with it to check the zero knowledge proofs and then the actual value of that accumulator itself. That is all that at a minimum is required to get this to work. Um, I don't really care what format it's in. If you want JSON or any of those binary formats I've listed below, or if you want additional dates, um, I, I'm hoping that as we do this, we maybe say like the dates or timestamps that we would like to require in this is like created at, maybe last updated at and expires at. I don't think registries should be forever. <laughs> um, I think they should expire in terms of key rotation. So in this case, because there is an accumulator verification key, um, as soon as you rotate the key, the whole accumulator is basically null and void, which is a way of just revoking all, everyone in it. So those are the three dates I would recommend. I did not put that there, but this is all optional because I wanted to get feedback from everyone. So I mainly wanted to start from the bottom, which says this is the bare minimum, and then add to it. So yeah. identifier could be in the same thing or you could have it on the outside. I don't really care, but the point was to say you should have an identifier and the minimum two keys. The first one says anytime an update is published, use this one to verify that the update is coming from the revocation manager. This one is for verifying any zero knowledge proofs that come from it. And this is the current value. Timestamps can be helpful to say what, you know, how fresh is this? For example, if you're not on a blockchain, that's more important. If you are, maybe it's a little less. So anyway, um, I've outlined some of kind of the preliminary building blocks from a cryptographic standpoint from the paper. I have not translated all of it from the paper yet, but the idea is that um, when a credential is signed, the issuer, adds a revocation claim into the credential. They can have one, they could have any number of these. Maybe this registry represents the status of suspended or not, revoked or not, or issued or not, 
it doesn't matter. Uh, that's what these stand for. But the point is the, re the cumulative represents a single bit value of information for a status, basically a membership check. So in this case, you can do this issuance in a blind way, just like you can with BBS Plus. But the revocation manager does need to know what the actual value is going into it. So when I say we can do blind issuance, I mean BBS plus punchable standards as part of their blind signature format, you can just add this in as an additional claim. That's what I mean. Okay, so um, before I kind of dive more into the details, what this does get you um, is I wanted to find a, a method that does not require the user to download or anyone for that matter, a big massive list for checking against something. So like in a verifier, if like revocation list 2020 or any of those updates, I have to download a big list. Even if it's just a bit string, I still have to download a big list. <laughs> and I didn't want that. I just wanted something very simple uh, that reflects the current state of affairs and doesn't leak how many credentials have been issued. It doesn't, rep and you can't guess uh, who's in it, who's not or anything like that. And it shouldn't leak who's being checked and updates are kept to a minimum. One of the downsides of accumulators in the past is that any updates added, addition, add, adds or removals required an update. This fixes at least half of that. You still have to update for removals, but not for ads. And I also wanted to make it so it could run in an MPC environment. So the third step was I wanted to limit how much uh, penalty you got for being offline. If you are offline with the current indie-based accumulator, you have more updates that are required to uh, basically more computation you have to do. So I didn't want to penalize people for being offline. I wanted to make it so that whether they're offline for a year or a month or a day, it's the same amount of work for them to do. But in order to do that, they we, we also had to make it so that they could not be tracked across updates as well. And this solves those problems. So this uh, proposal does not require the user to phone home per se. They do have to do some update to make sure that they are current. If they are current, then they have nothing else to do. They're done. But if they are not current, then they do have to do some computation with the revocation manager. Now, whether the revocation manager and the issuer are the same party, it doesn't matter. That can be the case, but is not required. The difference is whoever the revocation manager is, the user will communicate with them to get an update in an anonymous way such that the revocation manager does not know who is asking for updates to become current. And it also does not require the issuer in an MPC saying to really do any MPC at all. The servers just do one thing each and they don't even know which responses or, or who's asking and whether it's the same party or multiple parties. So there's a good deal of privacy with this approach. Okay, so in uh, method one, this is entirely holder based where the holder says, I need to update something. So basically what they do is in order to get current is they take the revocation claim, they basically split that into Shamir secret shares and send those one at a time to the revocation manager. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's all the same server, it can be, but in an MPC setting like on lit where there's 30 nodes, you know, you might be querying 20 of the 30 or 10 of the 30, it doesn't matter, the nodes don't know the difference. So if you want to insert dummy values, which I do state here, they can be fake or real. The server's not going to know the difference. The reason you can do dummy values is if the holder is trying to cheat and was never issued a credential in the first place or doesn't have any like a witness or the claim itself, then the response he gets back from the revocation manager is actually useless. So it's only valid if he held a valid credential at a given point in time. Otherwise, it's useless. And, and likewise, if they are revoked, the update they get back 
just nullifies their signature. So if they're trying to cheat, they don't want to update. But obviously, if they don't update, then they can't prove that they're current. So by updating, they just nullified their signature. So at this point, the holder is talking to the revocation manager directly, and only three methods are required. The fourth is just done locally. So the client says, I need an update. They split their claims into shares, send it to the issuer. The issuer does their computation and the nodes don't, like I said, don't have to talk to each other and they just send a response. Then the holder gets back once they have T results, they can call an update and then check to make sure that they're current. Method two allows you, like in some cases, Stephen, you've proposed like maybe the verifier because this can be done anonymously. Maybe the verifier could act as a proxy in that case and such that this, pro this proxy is semi-trusted, um, but the only thing they're required to do in that case is just forward the responses and return the responses. That's it. Like they can inspect the packets, but it should it's just gonna be garbage anyway. So best they could do is perform a denial of service, in which case the holder would just go to the issuer directly and not use them anyway. So they don't gain a lot by being a proxy in the first place. The rest of this is just talking about some con security considerations, like what happens if the holder is malicious or any party is malicious, how to perform verification, what's required to download, how to add it. Uh, we do support this for any signature type, not just the pairing based ones. You could do this with ED25519. We have a client doing that, um, ECDSA and some others. So this is not restricted to anonymous credentials. This was meant to be an agnostic revocation scheme, but the reason I'm proposing it for anonymous credentials is because of the privacy considerations. So with that, I'm pretty much done without diving into the details too much, uh, but we can dive into the details as much as people want now. So any questions or clarification? Yeah, one question, Mike. So isn't it an organization challenge? Because let's say if you're a revocation manager, uh, for this to be used, you have to find a decentralized escrow of some sort to uh, basically up issue up, like give updates, witness updates, right? Unless the use, unless in the use case, the revocation manager is inherently a decentralized party, uh, you have to find a party, right? So isn't that a challenge? And I'm, I understand it's a it's a non technical challenge, but just curious, you know that. Uh, so you're, when you mean like they're a trusted party, just like the issuer, but in our setting, oh. like the issuer holds all of the actual data and like lit being the revocation manager just manages keys only. So lit doesn't manage the list of revoked values. They don't manage the accumulator. They don't manage anything, but here's the verification key and the update key. That's it. And the signing keys. So is that what you mean? Because if you're talking about in the update case, yeah, you want the issuer to be honest, but the only thing they're going to do if they're being malicious in when the client is trying to update their witness is they're just going to get bad data back, which is basically just a denial of service. But that's caught when the the holder does their witness check. When they when they go to apply the results from the revocation manager, they're going to check and go, wait a minute, I didn't get the result I was expecting. So my, uh, I'll explain for example. So let's say uh, you're an IDV identity provider, and what you do is issue KYC credentials. Now you want to set up revocation. Now in your case, I have to find a decentralized group, which will help, which will hold the secret keys that will help in the witness update, right? So nope. in case. No. No, they, they, like I said, the issuer and the whole and the revocation manager can be the same party, and this does not have to be done in an MPC setting. Then, then the revocation manager will know which witness he's talking to, so unless I'm using a proxy. No, uh, if it's using method one. No, the when a when a holder is getting a witness update, the issuer or revocation manager does not know who it is. They might know through some other way, like an IP address but they won't know which witness they're being asked to update or who's asking it. They can't correlate it. 
So there's a, let's say there's only one revocation manager, right? So I'm fine if there are multiple revocation managers and they are, uh, they don't trust each other and they're supposed to act honestly, or a threshold is supposed to act honestly. Assume there is one revocation manager. Now, when a witness goes to update, uh, get, uh, goes to him to get the witness update, uh, so he will have to tell him what his revocation ID is, right? No, he does not. No, that that's the idea behind this. Because if he leaks his revocation ID, then hmm. the revocation manager knows who they are. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's my that's the confusion I have. Like, uh, so I'm looking at the Alistair paper, and if you can just point me to the page or the section where uh, this shows, because in a single server protocol, I do see that the uh, in the updates you will have uh, the Y value being sent, right? Unless you're using yeah, a look in the appendix because it's one of those methods. I don't remember exactly where it is. It's been a while since I've looked at it, but no, you do not have to leak the ID. In the appendix, you're saying? Yeah. Okay. That's where we tried to put all of the algorithms. We originally had them kind of spread throughout the paper and then moved them all to the end. It's like the original paper, at least with all the theory and stuff behind, it, I think is the first 20 to 30 pages. And then the appendix is all of the methods. We also do have working Rust code if you're interested in looking at that. Okay, I can do with the paper for two seconds. Uh, I'm not following her, actually. I had an impression that you, uh, in a single revocation manager case, the uh, the revocation ID will be learned by the manager. So I'll check more. Yep. You know, you can run in a single server if you wanted to, like, simplify things. Yeah, you just leak it, and then you're done. <laughs> that, so that's what I'm asking. If you have a single server. But you don't have if, to do that. You can do it in the exact same way as you would a multi-server, which is the client splits their claim into shares and sends it. The issuer, as long as they support it, will go, oh, I've got a share. I don't know which one it is or from which client it is. And the client can say, I'll just send 10 different requests, even though I only really need three of them. But so, all those servers will be owned by the single revocation manager, right? Yep. But that doesn't mean that they can cheat and know who they are. No, but if I'm running three, so if I'm running 10, if I'm the revocation manager, just one party, I can run 10 different servers. The 10 servers will receive the request. Uh, I can just know what the revocation ID is because I'll have more than threshold shares to reconstruct it. Yeah, you could if you knew which shares belong to which group. But that is easy to know. Let's like, assuming you're getting hundreds of these requests from hundreds mm -hmm. of different claims. You don't know which shares or which belong to who. They just look like random shares. Like if you follow the theory in the paper, this is secure in the adversarial model. All they're getting is random shares or random scalars. You don't know which group they belong to, whether it's the same one or somebody else. So yeah, while you may be able to grab them all, if you've got a hundred, the only way you can try to guess what it is is by brute force, which is no harder than what they could do today. If you're the issuer, that means you already know all the values anyway. And so all you're gonna do is say, all right, who just asked for the update? Okay, but that's the point of this thing, right? It's to hide from the issuer because if you look at it in a single server setting, what at a high level it is this uh, decentralization is doing is, uh, if you had a single server, you can just ask for the issuer to up give you an updated witness, no matter how old your witness is, he can just do a single scale multiplication and give you the result. Uh, in this case, what you're doing is essentially uh, doing this witness update in an MPC fashion. So rather than assuming one issuer, you have a set, a group of issuers and a threshold of them uh, do this uh, witness update using the secret key. So maybe I'm missing something, but it, it feels like in a single server case, I can just grab all and just uh, know what- grab them all like we were just saying, but you don't know whether they're the same or real or fake. Um, the only way you okay. can do things is by is by brute force. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll look at the paper again and uh, give to you because yeah, it at least answers part of my question. So in a threshold, sorry, in a single revocation manager case, when he's running all the servers, then 
yeah he can just get that uh, or at least yeah he can it's it's not much. okay thank you for that Mike. the, the collusion sorry. resistance i'm talking about is um like the verifier and the holder could could break anonymity if they were able to like collude and say here's the ip address and things like that oh no i wasn't uh what no ip address uh, we can assume that all that is uh, taken care of by an application layer protocol. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But the idea behind this was that you can move to a threshold setting and that's more secure. If you want to do a single server setting, fine. You're already trusting the issuer anyway. But we wanted to not do the same phone home requirements that you see with a lot of these other proposals. <laughs> where they have to ask the issuer or like the verifiers asking the issuer, is this credential revoked? We didn't want that. That's really bad from a privacy perspective. Yeah, that's fine. I think uh, so they, uh, so assume a single, so in a threshold setting or let's say in a setting where the revocation manager is uh, decentralized, right? So it's not a single entity, but there are multiple independent uh, untrusting entities. Also makes perfect sense. I'm saying in a single, when, you can't do that for because like your use case in your use case it's inherently a single party. Then uh, obviously ask verifiers and the issuer is silly. Uh, you can, there, there are two ways. Either you can the holder can ask the witness uh, from the issuer, uh, a decentralized version of which is Alasor, or uh, you can download the update data, which is going to be taking some time. But uh, you can yeah you can download the data and well, then if you read the Alasor paper, if if all the updates were published then mm. anybody with enough updates published, then mm. anybody can break the scheme eventually and get the private key. So in fact, publishing updates with accumulators is actually a bad idea. That's what we, that's another thing we discovered. I did not put this here, but that is the other reason why you don't want to publish deltas for an accumulator, at least with this, the paper that we originally were looking at. If enough witness updates are published, now, witness updates don't leak which witnesses are being updated. It's kind of like just these are global values that everybody can use. With mm -hmm. enough of those published, an attacker can break and get the private key. So we wanted a way that doesn't require any updates to be published other than the change of the accumulator, because that doesn't break anything. We're talking about, say, a change of deltas. Okay, I'm uh, surprised by that. So if you can, again, point me to a uh, specific section of the paper, or maybe just tell me the, like what you're exactly calling that uh, attack, I can uh, look in that because I'll be, yeah, I'm curious how how you can do that uh, because that's just a polynomial uh, uh, that involving your secret key and your, uh, yeah, you know, involving yep. secret By key evaluating the polynomial enough, once you get enough points, you can correlate it and get the private key back. Yeah. Uh, can we'll, you point me to a section? We'll of communicate the offline. Um, I can I can point you to the specific sections. If you want to meet, meet, I'm in the oh shoot Discord. I'm in Discord. If you want a message, we I'm happy to yeah. chat. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Mike. You mentioned um, different key types. Is the same attributes available the, with the different key types? More well, yes. Yeah, because I'm just talking about revocation. So yeah, if you're yeah, presenting yeah. with a Schnorr-based signature, you have all the limitations that Schnorr gives you, but you still get the ZKP-based revocation with it. Does that That's make sense? That's what I mean. Okay, okay. Um, so another question I had is, how are how does the revocation get bound to the credential? How do we know, how does the, when the proof of the revocation is produced, how is that bound to the credential itself? So if I'm presenting the credential, so the idea, so the question I'm asking, and I'm sure there's a way I just, I'm just wondering about it is, I have two credentials, I present one credential and my revocation proof is from the other one. Um, is there, is there okay. a binding between them? Or how does that yeah. work? Yeah, it's the same binding that happens in a non-creds one. There is a specific claim in this case, like if you're using the privacy-based signatures, CL, BBS, or PS, okay. that revocation claim is, uh, it's selectively disclosed, meaning it's just hidden, but you're proving that 
that hidden attribute is also the one that's in the accumulator, but you're not disclosing it. Okay. He's saying this hidden attribute, which was signed into the credential, is also in the revocation registry. Okay. And that's the binding that's occurring. Yep. That's the binding. So the reason I'm, well, we can get, well, the reason I'm asking is um, the, the other work that's going on um, at W3C, for instance, VCDI, BBS, could this scheme, revocation scheme be used with that credential scheme, that VC scheme? It can be used with any of them. Depends on what level of privacy you want. So, like I said, in Appendix K of, of the Alistair paper, we show how to do it with Schnorr signatures where you don't leak. Like the user has, in the Schnorr-based setting, the user has signed the revocation claim. Um, or Sorry, the revocation claim is acting as the key, and they're okay. signing uh, something. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was because it's been two years since I wrote the paper. Uh, they're signing with it, so it's not being disclosed, but it's also bundled with um, two things from the issuer. One is the witness and the other is something else, another signature. Both are not disclosed. So it's all privacy preserving in that sense. Mm -hmm. Anything else that you're trying to do with Schnorr or ED519, for example, that you know has all of those limitations. But this, like I said, in Appendix K, I showed how to do this in a privacy preserving way. Um, let me ask. Here, this can be used with anything, not just the non-creds. Yeah, and that's what I'm wondering. Um, the VCDI BBS does not have a revocation scheme with it, so its unlinkability is all good as long as you don't use revocation, which is, of course, <laughs> no good. <laughs> yeah. Um, suppose that I have a, a very bored revocation manager and I send five, I want to get my witness updated. So I send in five shards all with the same last updated time. So it's clear it's me. It's one, one request coming in five ways. Can the revocation claim be constructed if all of that is known? Uh, uh, they'd still have to brute force it. So if you think about it, the okay. each share has what's called an X and a Y coordinate. Yeah. So this is based on polynomials. You're only sending in the Y values. So they'd still have to guess the X values, which probably wouldn't be hard in the <laughs> in this case, right? Because okay. I can try, all right, try this one with one, try this one with two, try this one with three, four, five. So it's just five factorial. So within a few seconds, I've got it, right? Yeah. Assuming we knew it was all belonged to the same person. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Okay. In case um, you would like it and you're no better than just saying, hey, here's my revocation claim, just update me. Right. <laughs> and then... um, next question I had related to that. Um, the last update time, presumably that is um, going to be the time that, you know, when you get, when you get an update, um, can that be any time between accumulator updates? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, so yeah, as long can, as you, you don't can change it and say, I was last updated this time and the issuer goes, okay, I'll just take everything from then to now. Right. And that time can be any time. Uh, as long as you don't miss an accumulator update, you're okay. No, you can miss an, you can miss an update. That, that's the oh. point. You're not penalized for being offline. The The issuer does a little bit more work because most of the work is going to be done on the issuer, but that's fine because he's he's got the trap door or the secret key. So the computation's not terribly intensive as it would be on the client. So what spurred this is I was working with, I'm trying to remember his name from uh, Australia where he was doing revocation schemes for his PhD on the business side. No, yeah. don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll find his name after his meeting, I'm sure. Uh, he's at Diff. But anyway, the point was when we were looking, if, if the client did all the work, 
like a year missed a year worth of updates versus a month it took like almost six to or what was it six to eight hours to just do that update locally <laughs> it was awful and we had to download all of that data so this this avoids that because the issuer has everything that he needs and just goes i'm updating you from this time to now but the result that's returned is a fixed size. Yeah. Okay, let me ask it a different way. Suppose I, as an issuer, I update, I, I do batch revocations on the first day of every month. Sure. January through December. So I'm, uh, I have a, a credential, so I'm a holder. I say, I go in on June 3rd and request an update. Do I pass in uh, and I get an update? So I'm updated as of June 3rd. Mm -hmm. And then in November, I go and update again. I want to I want to do another update. Do I have to say June 3rd? Can I say February 1st was my last update and I'll get an accurate one? Sure. Do I, or do I have to be precise? Um. So you can't just pick arbitrary times, but like, for example, when you were issued, let's say you were issued February. Okay. Yeah. You couldn't ask for one in January. That would basically screw me up. <laughs> right. Okay. That would screw you up. Okay. So if I go, so I have to, I can't go previous. I have to go, but I, and I, can I skip them though? Cause and I sit, get one in February and then say, oh, I was last updated in June. Will I get an accurate number or not? Yeah. You, After well, accurate result. Okay. So let's say I was issued in February and then you say I was last updated in June. Yeah. Um, no, that would, that would be bad too. <laughs> However, so, let's say okay. you said, okay, I was last updated in February and I want to go to May. Yeah. Even though it's June. You could do that. And then you could okay. ask another update again that says, give me from May to June. Okay. And locally, you could save those intermediate values. And then from then on, you could ask for, I mean, that's just a powerful way of increasing privacy. Yeah. Not, yeah. It's the scheme is not perfect. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to understand the, the parameters around it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um. So whatever witness value you have at a specific, you know, publish date or whatever, you can ask an update from that value to yeah. whatever time you want. You can't just ask arbitrarily. Like if I don't have a witness prior to February, then I can't ask for anything prior to then. So yeah. all you're all you're trying to do in that case is fool the issuer, right? The well, the, no, I, the, 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 I think the two things you're you're worried about is your the things you leak are your IP address potentially, which again the proxy gets rid of, and then the last update time because you're sharing the last update time, yeah. and and um, what what your that's the most so if you always use to the second update time, then. You know, potentially they could track it, but you know they don't know who you are, but they know how often you do things. Uh, I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just looking yeah. at where you say things are leaking, and and that's just what I'm just trying to address. So I could, you know, say June third at, you know, exactly midnight, and then later go June tenth because I know that no update was done until July first. So I can do any time between when I got it updated and, and July 1st. As long as I don't go over July 1st, I, I would be okay. Yep. Anyway, so all yeah, you, yeah, that that just boils down to um yeah, you know, that's implementation details, like the cryptography yeah. doesn't even use yeah. timestamps at all. I, so, I was trying to figure out yeah, the, the balance between what's you know detail and what's cryptographically required. Cryptographically required is you don't miss any updates, any actual updates to the accumulator. Yep. Okay. So I'll stop and then I'll let Richard yeah. take over since I know he wanted to do his presentation on Doc. Yeah, please. But before that, uh, uh, Richard, before that, I actually saw the video that you uh, sent me the last meeting. There were some... Uh, comments and I would like to clarify. Uh, so can I just start? I just like three, four points well, to make. I actually think that should be good. Um, so I don't know, Francis or, or 
Jose as well. And Steve, I don't know, were, were you, are you following the discord conversation where we were talking about where I shared links to doc stuff? What level of, of information does this group have? Um, not enough. <laughs> so. What I'm trying to figure out is how we bring things together and, and at what level things fit. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay. So, so the key information for this group before we go into any detail is that in the discord server, and I will copy that message here, uh, in the Anon creds V2, uh, yeah. uh, thread, uh, I guess, uh, channel, uh, I shared links to docs, uh, doc has a, two libraries that are relevant. One is called doc SDK and it's public, uh, MIT licensed on, uh, on GitHub in the doc network, uh, org. And that SDK contains our credential formats as well as our blockchain interactions. And uh, what we're intending to do in order to make it easier to consume the credential formats is to separate those into two separate libraries, one for credentials, one for blockchain. And we need to decide uh, what level of, of uh, you know abstraction is needed there. And yeah. then we also have a set of, of crypto libraries uh, written in Rust and TypeScript. And so that that SDK is very high level. It just shows you how to use the crypto libraries in order to generate actual credentials. But the crypto libraries have the magic that supports all the different features that the, the Anon creds has needed in the past. Yeah, so, we talk about. yeah, so Rich, and I, I looked at both. So there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, good stuff there. Um, you could basically swap out all of uh, Anon Creds V2's crypto with docs, that's totally fine. What is missing is kind of the glue from the presentation site. Now, I didn't go into as much details on how those presentations are decided on docs, but um, that is what's missing. So at least in Anon Creds V2, and this is still subject to change, there's this idea of you know statements that you're trying to prove and then how to glue all of those statements together in a single presentation. Um, so a lot of that code is also in the Anoncreds V2 library. So I'm in the middle of trying to separate out the cryptography from that layer. Um, right now, they're all kind of one and the same, but the cryptography could easily be swapped out with docs with some minor changes for sure. Like that's Good. totally, it, <laughs> there's just specific statements and, uh, verifications that would just need a change on doc side but it's totally doable i have no doubt in lavesh's abilities <laughs> to do that so i have uh, a few points to make first uh, uh sdk the sdk library is i would say not that relevant for this group because it's a very high level wrapper eventually yes that is how our uh, uh closed source projects products make use of the credential stuff but that is not super relevant it's a very thin uh layer the most relevant are the Rust library and the TypeScript library. The Rust library uh, contains all the statement proof, whatever you're saying, but it does not have the notion of a credential or a presentation. It's intentionally just contains the crypto. And yeah, there's not much abstraction there. In the TypeScript library, there are abstractions for credentials, schemas, presentations. So a schema has certain structure, how it's going to be serialized into a list of messages to be sent to the uh, the crypto layer, uh, that's the abstract, that's the conversion that's happening in the TypeScript layer. So yeah, if you're looking for abstractions, uh, TypeScript layer is a thing and it has a bunch of things, other things as well. So not just credentials and schema and presentations, but also how to build blinded credentials. So let's say you have credential, you want to request credential, you want to hide certain attributes uh, in that. You also want to prove that the it's the same attribute as another credential. So let's say you're basing a credential of a, of a government ID, right? Uh, I, I come to you with KY, your KYC provider. I tell you, give me a credential uh, that contains my social security number, but you're not privy to that social security number. You, the issuer, are not privy to that. I can assure you that the social security number is going to be same as in my government ID, and you can do a presentation. So that's just a simple example, but you can do, so whatever uh, you can do in presentations that we allow, like doing inequality checks, equality checks, uh, range proof, uh, CERCOM, et cetera, whatever you're doing, you can uh, basically do uh, in that. Anyway, so those are all the, yeah, the abstractions stay there. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Yeah, no, it's mostly just a matter of coalescing the two. 
because Doc has done things a specific way, and then I just did it for non creds v2 as a starting point. Like, okay. as far as I know, Stephen, we haven't really decided anything, so I'm yeah. sure we can collaborate on a standard. Yeah. Okay, and then before, before, before we uh, end the meeting, I just had a, a few points to make. Uh, I actually watched the recording of the last call, and there were some comments made, and I'm, I am want to clarify our position there. So one of the comment was that the Rust library is uh, monolithic, like it's just one thing. And uh, Mike, your comment was you cannot use it. Uh, like it's just if you just want to use one piece of it, you can't use it. Like you have to get the whole thing. So I don't see. Well, no, that, well you've got a big mono repo for the for crypto, but I know you can pull out the individual components for sure. Okay, then what's the problem? Because like, would you say make the same comment about the Rust? Uh, standard Rust crypto hashes library or the Cypress library because they also have a big repo and it's just a workspace structure. So I don't understand the problem with that. Like if you can, like you said, you can pull individual pieces out of it, right? Like as different crates. So what? Mostly what when is... you want to work with it, like if you want to fork and make updates, you have to fork the entire repo. I, I'm just not a big fan of mono repos in general, having done a ton of those in Coinbase where cloning the entire repo took like 30 minutes. And... Anytime you wanted to run an update, the CI would have to run a billion checks because it has to test every workspace, everything, just to make sure you're not committing something. And people weren't smart with the CI. I know there's ways to limit that, but no mm -hmm. one ever does it. So that's those are my my biggest gripes with mono repos. Personally, I'd rather prefer things be broken into a separate repo, one package, one thing, not the workspace. I don't like the workspace first, but that's just my preference. Some people okay. like that. You obviously mm -hmm. do, and that's fine. That's just a preference. Okay, so just to clarify, a lot of bad, bad. I've been burned by it before, and so I don't like it. Okay, so I'll just clarify this: that the it's not it's not a monolith, but a mono repo. That is the problem. Like you, you can use a BBS package or the generator package or the uh, let's sharing yeah. package, share package if you uh, if you want to. Yeah, right. yeah. You just yeah, you just specify the repo and then which workspace yeah. you want. That's fine. Pulling it down is not the problem. Working with it, if I want to make updates or anything like that, that's where it gets nasty. So. Okay. All right. Uh, other comment was regarding uh, coconut was broken. Uh, like you said that there's an implementation of coconut and uh, that is broken. So it's not the like if you've seen the readme in that it's not the. Coconut was proposed. It's a modified implementation of Coconut, right? Uh, so was your comment regarding the old implementation, which we don't have, or? Most yeah, likely. What? Just in talking to Jan Kamenish recently, he just said, anybody still using Coconut doesn't know it's broken. <laughs> um, okay, I, I haven't seen any. Uh, so uh, He hasn't published been... anything. This is just by word of mouth. I, I attended one of his uh, talks recently, you know, because he was giving us... Uh, presentation from Definity, and I just asked him about that. And okay. that was his verbal response. Any more details you have, like what's broken exactly? Uh, well, when I tried to push for more details, Manu Driver specifically said a lot of the proofs are broken, like the security proofs. So there's a lack of security guarantees. That was the main thing. Um, there might be more, there might be less. I didn't get enough. Because I wasn't okay. the only one asking questions. <laughs> okay. All right. So one more. Yeah, uh, I'm them for more details because I don't have them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, some more, some I can ask them when I go to Eurocrypt in a, in two weeks. If they're there, I can ask them and see what they mm -hmm. say. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, one comment was regarding the threshold BBS plus, and he was saying it has eight rounds, which is like incorrect. It has just two rounds. Um, once you've so, done the OT. Uh, yes, once you've done OT, you do only once, right? The key gen and OT is just done once. The base OT is done once, and now it's, it's just two rounds. Two rounds, okay. Well, so I was including the OT. So if you're saying you, you've you already done the base OT because you've done one key setup, fine. In my experience in decentralized key management, that base OT is good for a short time because... In our case, in the threshold setting, nodes come and go. They go offline, that some new ones get added, things like that. So you're never just static. So we've looked at doing a PCG-based approach, which once you've done the PCG setup, and it has the same problem, right? Like, But in that, you have to do the setup, uh, 
every time a node comes or goes, well, we've kind of gotten a threshold saying so that that simplifies things a bit, but then it's that's only it's uh it's non-interactive after that. Okay, but ECG setup, I can just do I I uh, signing a request comes in for BBS plus. We do a non-interactive uh, PCG distribute the signing shares and you're done. So it's kind of like you only speak once protocols. So okay, I'm not discounting what you've done. I like it. Don't get me wrong. No, I'm, uh, no, no I, uh, I'm just not going to understand what. Uh, so you said like in experience OT is like you uh, just doing OT once is not fine. So I can you provide more details of why doing the PC setup once is fine, but uh, not doing the OT setup, the base OT setup one is once is fine. Like what specifically is the problem? No, well, TIF setup is just, you just have to run it. That's all. PCG setup, believe me, is a little more complicated than the base OT. But mm. when you're done with it, then you don't have to interact at all again. Same with the base OT, right? PC setup, you also have to run it. So same with the... So assuming what you're saying is, let's say the base OT and PC setup in terms of security are equivalent, assuming that, then both you have to run the setup both once, right? After that, you can do the two round signing or like whatever signing implementation is. Well, from when I read the threshold paper, it looks like it's three rounds. So maybe I missed something, but from my understanding to have full security in the malicious adversary setting, you have to have three rounds where the last round produces the signing shares. In the PCG setting, there are no rounds at all. That that's That was my opinion. There are no rounds. I mean, like there is interaction. That once you run the PCG, the signers still have to communicate. Uh, no, communicate no, they don't. The no, once you have the PCG, the signers don't talk to each other at all. They get Why a signing they request. Mean? They get the signing request. They 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 compute the signing share and they send it back to the issuer or to the requester, just like you would a BLS signature. Hey, can you I apologize because uh, I have a hard stop in five minutes. But my yeah, really. question is, what's the next yeah. step? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but I do have one more uh, point, which is about so you and I debate the cryptography offline, so we don't. No, it's not a crypto. Uh, it's not a crypto discussion, but uh, your comment was uh, a lot of code in our uh, repos were copied over, especially the DKG stuff, and also you said like the accumulator stuff was copied over. So, uh, can you provide specific examples of what really what specifically is copied over? I don't remember anything being copied over. Um. Uh, then why don't okay. we talk offline, Lavesh? <laughs> That's not relevant to this discussion because I don't even remember asking that question. Oh, you just it was make a comment like, you uh, made in the recording, and our team was like, Oh, well, if we did that by accident, we need to make sure we credit. So we just wanted to, if you could remember what it was, you said it looked like your code. So we'll, we'll make sure to credit. Well, that. I'm, I'm a little sensitive to that. I will give a little background here. I have been sued because by companies because they thought that, um, I had donated code to them or I was using my own code that I had written before I came to them and I've been sued to have it taken away from me legally. And so that is why you see the Hyperledger Agora Labs project is an effort to fix that. So I don't get those anymore. And so I'm hypersensitive to people copying out my code. Yeah. So it was just a comment you you made in the last call. So if you feel that way, let us know. So, and we can, we can resolve that on this, on the chat, like you said. Um, okay. Richard, yeah, that, you said, um, what's the next step? That That's what I'd like to get to. Um, I think the next one is, can you own the next meeting? <laughs> um, the current plan would it, 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 to go through it. Um, I was hoping to, you know, understand how we could collaborate together. So that's really what I want to get to. And maybe next time you could, um, go do a presentation or just a summary of of what you're thinking could be done. Um, there's a bunch of work going on, what you're doing, what Mike's doing, um, the VCDI BS, BBS work, the specification work in particular that's going on. And I'd really like us to figure out how we can come together and work on things. There's, you know, as was talked about, three or four levels here, at least three levels. <laughs> and and I'm trying to understand how those levels fit together. Like, you know, RDF canonicalization versus the canonicalization that that um 
you know, the claim level that, that happens in a non -preds and and things like that. Um, the plan is to meet in two weeks at uh, in the afternoon so that um, folks from um, New Zealand can join. Is that okay to meet at that time? Francis, that's right. a little late for you. Jose, that's probably a little late for you and that it'll be six o'clock Eastern, but um, I'm hoping you don't mind and can join. And that's two weeks from today. Is that reasonable time frame? Uh, I can be there. The biggest challenge to that is it's U.S. Memorial Day. Oh, is it? Oh, shoot. Um, can I do it next Monday? I'm I'm on vacation next week, but I'm trying to. But I'd love to do this conversation. Um, I can meet next Monday, but yeah, I can't meet Memorial Day. I'll be in Eurocrypt. Okay. All right, let me aim for next week, Lex, Monday. Um, <clears throat> I will send notices. Francis, if you could, I don't know, I have contact info for you, but um, let me know how I can, or, or monitor um, the timing, monitor this um, meetings page. Um, so you'll get the time of when we're meeting and I'll, and I'll also send it out on the, the mailing list. Um, there is a calendar that I always update every week as well um, uh, at lists.hyperledger. So you could also check on that, list.hyperledger. Um, and then there's an anon creds calendar there. Um, I think that's a publicly available one and um, people can get there. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. And, and please schedule without me. I'm, I'm on Memorial Day as well. I'm off. So, but yeah, I'll just join Thanks. as I can. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So we're, so I'm going to move likely to the 20th. I just have to verify my schedule as to what's best. I might just do it at this time next Monday. And Richard, you and I coordinate over the week to figure out what that you take the bulk of the time for overview of doc things. Would that be good? Yeah. I, I don't know how much an overview is. I'm more interested. Okay. Uh, so Levesh and I will talk about what overview makes sense for the audience. I don't know the audience very well. And like we've seen, it can go into a lot of detail. But, yeah. uh, but my biggest concern is um, you know, we have our format in production today. So it's like how yeah, much exactly. are we worried about backwards compatibility? Uh, how how much are we, you know, what changes does this group think is needed? How much evaluation do you want to do? That kind of thing. But we can, okay, I can lead that discussion. Thing, yeah. The biggest thing I want to understand is how it fits with either an on creds or VCDI, BBS, um, what, you know, I've got a bit of a summary on the page of, you know, of what VCDI has in it um, and, and what is not there. So selective disclosure, unlinkability, those are there. What's left off is revocation, blinded secret, claim equality. You know, those are the things that, um, uh, that, that is in a non-preds too, but not in VCDI the canonicalization. So at that level of meeting, anyway, yeah. I know you've got to run. Hey, Thanks all for I this. I can do yeah. next Monday. I can do either this time or the uh, okay. New Zealand overlap, whichever one's more convenient. Yeah. I suspect it'll be this time, but let me make sure. Okay. Thanks. Thanks all. Much appreciated. Bye. See ya.